Well, good morning. It is such a delight and blessing to see each of you here this morning. And I am looking forward to our time of praise and worship and giving thanks to the Lord together. Uh, please let me begin with making a couple of announcements. If you're still out in the hallway, come on in and uh, let's begin our time together. Um, first of all, uh, there aren't a lot of announcements. Please refer to the bulletin to catch up on all the details. But um, let me just mention that care groups is today. Everyone's invited if you would like to participate in care groups. Um, and the care groups are at the Tolleson. Uh, the Tolleson care group is at the Fitzhenry home. All right, and everybody's welcome to join that one. The Dillabaugh's. They don't move theirs around much, so the Dillabaugh's is at their house, and you would be welcome to join them there as well today. And then we will uh, take a break from care groups for the months of July and August, start back up in September. Um, are there other announcements, perhaps, that need to be made uh, related to our church family here? Okay, nothing that I've forgotten. Well, um, we need to begin this Lord's Day with rejoicing in the work of God in uh, our nation with the repeal of Roe versus Wade. And so I want to encourage you to verbally express your praise to the Lord and join with me in saying, glory to God. So, glory to God. <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, um, I'm too young to ever remember a day when abortion was illegal in the United States. And so, unlike some of you, it was hard for me to imagine <laughs> what this day, this day that we have prayed for and uh, worked towards and voted regarding, it was hard for me to imagine what this day would be like when um, justices would strike down the precedent of, pr of a previous court and, uh, and, and stop the federal constitutional protection for the murder of little babies in the womb. And um, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord for what he has done. I think we do need to remember that the work of elevating life, that is not complete, right? The, the work is not done. Um, there are many, many, as the various protests and pickets have demonstrated, there are many hearts that need yet to be won to honor, number one, the sanctity of life, but more than that, to honor God, the creator of life, and to trust in him. So the work is not done, but there is a lot, a lot to celebrate and to praise the Lord for. I want to read to us this morning from Psalm 139 regarding God's creation of life. And so this is, by the way, in your bulletin. It's going to be on the screen um, so you can follow along in reading. Uh, why don't you read aloud with me as I read uh, Psalm 139, verses 13 to 17. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, in your book was written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Let's pray together. O oh, dear Heavenly Father, um, we do have much to praise you for. We thank you for answering the cry of our hearts here in the United States of America where for so many decades, um, the taking of unborn life has been legalized murder in our country. 
And Lord, we thank you that these justices have seen the legal folly and the, the moral mistake that was made in Roe v. Wade. And Lord, we praise you that these justices have had the courage of their convictions to strike down and repeal that um, precedent. And Lord, we know that the hearts of humans are fickle, so we don't know how long this uh, reprieve, this repeal will last, but we praise you for every life that will be saved because of this. And we pray, O oh God, for individual states, including our state of Indiana, that, Lord, um, that there would be a complete ban of the murder of innocent lives in the womb. And, and that, Lord, our legislature and government, uh, governor would have the courage to, um, to ban abortion. And there are many states who will be considering this over the coming months or perhaps years. And we pray, O oh God, that you would work in the heart of the king, so to speak, in the form of legislatures and governors, uh, to bring about a drastic, drastic reduction in abortion in our country and perhaps ultimately the end entirely. At the same time, Lord, we want to pray for churches. Help us to be compassionate for women who find themselves in a difficult situation. Help us to be more compassionate than judgmental. Help us to be helpful in giving. And Lord, even as our church has supported for years and will continue to support um, uh, Northwest Indiana uh, Pregnancy Centers, our Women's Center, Lord, they're going to need to retool. And I pray, oh God, that you would help them as they do so. And may we ourselves individually have opportunities to help women uh, who find themselves in a difficult pregnancy situation and providing for them uh, support and material things in any way that we possibly can. Perhaps now, oh God, there is even more work for the church to do and help us to do so with um, love and compassion and concern for those that are in need. But Lord, we, we end together this morning on a note of praise, thanking you for the ways in which you have changed this legal situation in our country. And may it be, O oh God, that it would never return to the dark days that it preceded through Roe v. Wade. Now, Lord, as we worship together, I pray that our hearts would be tuned in to the words that we sing together. I pray, O oh God, that we would uh, rejoice in you and your Son. May the Spirit lead us and work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you would stand as the worship team comes to lead us as we sing and worship together. Well, good morning. It is so good to see all of you. Let's sing together as we worship the Lord. Come, people of the risen King. Sing together, come people of the risen king. Become people of the risen king who delight to bring him praise. Come all into your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace.
and those weeping through the night come those who tell a battle won and those struggling the fight for his perfect love will never change and his mercies never Sing together, O church, arise. O church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. In on the goal, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to of the captive soul, but to rage against the captive, and with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side.
Amen. You may be seated. Scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 6. We were reading verses 10 to 18. Verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the whole strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And so we just sang a song regarding this, these uh, scriptures. And so now let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are thankful that you have provided for us all the equipment that is needed to do spiritual battle, that is needed to love one another, that is needed to love the world in a sense that, Lord, we desire that they see the same grace that we see through Jesus Christ. Lord, that's why we are here today. We're here to worship you, to praise you through song, through truth. Lord, your scripture means everything to us. We gauge our life by it. Lord, we measure our life against you, the standard of righteousness. And Lord, when we do that, we realize how small we are. Lord, it, it, it forces us into humility to bend the knee and look to you for the strength and the mercy and the courage to go on and fight this battle. And Lord, too, I am thankful for the decision that we have made in our court. Lord, it is so important that we value life. Because, Lord, you are the author of life. You give life and you take life. And blessed be the name of the Lord. So let us be good stewards of the life you've given us. It is not our own. We are bought with a price. But, Lord, until that day we see you face to face, let us worship. Let us glorify God and enjoy him forever until that day. Until then, Lord, we ask that the service would be good, the message would be strong, and your word would rest upon us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with us? We're going to continue singing. Uh, we're going to learn a new song together. You can go ahead and stand. Yeah. Um, we're going to learn a new song together this morning. My worth is not in what I own. This song was written by the Gettys. I really, I really love this song, um, especially maybe in our day and age. There's a lot of confusion about um, what people are worth. It, this is something a lot of my friends and different people I know really struggle with. Um, feeling worthy. Even in, in Christianity, um, we understand that we're sinful, and um, as humans, um, it, it sometimes our own works, that's not what makes us worthy of God, right? Our sin, of course, does not make us worthy of God. My worth is not in what I own or who I am, except who I am in Christ, and that's the message of this song. So, we're going to sing the first verse in the chorus so you get a feel for how the song goes. And then we're going to go back and we're going to sing the first verse in the chorus again and we'll go through the entire song. So as soon as you get a feel for how the song goes, please join in with us and sing. So the first verse. My worth is not in what I own. Not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth, my worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride and shame. 
But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. And then the chorus goes like this, I rejoice. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. So let's go back and let's start the song again. From the very beginning, my worth is not in what I am. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in a But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul. flowers we fade and die fame youth and beauty hurry by but life eternal calls to us at the cross I will not boast I will not boast in wealth or might or human My worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. Let's sing this together. I rejoice in my Redeemer. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. Trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. Amen. That was beautiful. I hear the Savior say. Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. 
Thank you, worship team, for leading us really to the throne of the Lord in worship and in praise to him. Um, we've sung this morning about uh, battle, right, spiritual uh, warfare that happens as we uh, sort of battle our own hearts sometimes and desires that we have for that which is not right and also happens kind of in, the, in prayer and against philosophies and powers and things that are listed there in the Bible. And, and yet that warfare, both that which takes place in us fighting against our own sin nature as well as against evil and lies of the devil in the world, that is based upon the cross, is it not? Because there the ultimate victory was won. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these great realities for this amazing truth that our value, both our worth and our unworthiness are shown to us at the cross. And we see your amazing love and yet we see your wrath against our sin. And how unworthy we are and yet, Lord, how grateful we are and we thank you for these things. We thank you that Jesus paid it all. And we pray, O oh God, that based upon that triumph at the cross, that we would move forward in our lives, in our Christian experience. We would fight against temptation. We would fight against indwelling sin. And that we would be honest and acknowledge how quickly we fall into uh, sins of the heart, and yet, Lord, we'd also be bold and proclaim the truth of God in the world and culture around us, which increasingly seems to reject your truth. Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand and use the spiritual armor that you have given to us by the Holy Spirit, providing for us 
righteousness and truth and the gospel of peace and prayer and uh, the helmet of salvation and faith in you. And Lord, may these things quench the fiery darts that are aimed at us. Lord, we also pray that you would be with um, our various missionaries. And today I especially think about our young people who serve in a variety of different capacities. It seems mostly in life action, but we have one going with a different ministry starting this fall as well. And so I pray for each one of them. Lord, as, as things kind of begin to ramp up in preparation for this fall for, for each of them, I pray that, Lord, you would bless these young people, that their experience in uh, training as well as in traveling ministry, that, Lord, these things would... Um, would be to their own growth, spiritually speaking, that you would provide for all of their needs. And for some of them, their first experience away from home and home church, I pray, Lord, that you would stretch them but sustain them and minister to them. I pray your encouragement to be upon them. And now, Lord, as we open up the text of your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and as... Um, Don prayed earlier that your word would rest upon us. May it even rest heavy upon us, Lord, that, that our hearts would be um, tender and receptive to the truth that you reveal to us in your word. And, and Lord, that, that we would take it all very, very seriously because these are the words of life. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, boys and girls, second grade and down can be dismissed to go to your class at this time. Thanks for being with us so far, and thanks to Lori for teaching uh, this morning. I will mention uh, maybe a couple of things. Uh, we will be having some times of prayer for different ones of our young people that are being sent out for ministry uh, this fall. So some of them um, <clears throat> may uh, leave at different times as uh, times um, because of their various schedules. So there probably will be more than one of those opportunities for prayer and um, one of them for sure next week. We look forward to sort of recommissioning them and sending them out for ministry uh, as the days come. And then if you would please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Lord willing, today we will complete uh, Romans chapter 7. And as you're turning there, let me kind of give you a little anecdote. The girls and I have been playing this little game that they got, um, and it's, it's a Lego version of Mousetrap. So uh, it's, it's very different from the traditional version of Mousetrap, but it does have mice, and it's got a little trap. Um, but the basic idea is, after a few little preliminaries, each turn... Uh, each player gets a chance to aim their mouse and kick it with this little thing um, at these little cheese towers. And if you can knock down one or more cheese towers, you get to keep those. And the idea is to have more cheese Lego blocks than any of the other players. The problem is, is with this little foot thing that you use to kick your mouse, which is really like a marble, right? Um, you cannot aim that foot, and you cannot aim your mouse, right? It's just going to go wherever it wants to go, pretty much no matter what, right? It just, you cannot, you cannot hit the target, right? And that's okay if it's a game, right? But sometimes in life, we have the experience of feeling as if we can't hit the target that we're aiming for. You know, whether that might be uh, financial goals or a desire for a relationship, um, we experience setbacks and delays. And sometimes, sometimes we experience just plain failure, right? We just, we don't get the job or we get fired, right? Or whatever it may be, we don't pass the test at school. We sometimes experience failure. Now, Spiritually speaking, how many of us ex experienced failure? Right? We, 
we experience the reality of not accomplishing the goals. Spiritually speaking, one of the goals that we should have, of course, is to have victory. Victory over temptation. Victory over sinful habits. And in Romans chapter 7, one of the things that Paul is accomplishing is he is helping us to understand the setbacks and the failures that we experience in our pursuit of victory over sin or our pursuit of personal holiness. So I'm going to read Romans 7, 13 to 25. I want you to follow along in your copy of the scriptures with me. And then I'm going to make a few comments and then we'll go through the outline that's contained there in your bulletin. So Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse number 13. And if you will remember... If you will remember, we used verse 13 last week as well. The previous verses prior to verse number 13 seem to be about a non-Christian's experience of sin. And then, starting in verse 13 or 14, especially verse number 14, we see what I believe is the experience of a Christian believer and their battle against sin. So let's read this together. I'll read aloud, you follow along quietly. Romans 7, beginning in verse number 13, Did that which is good, meaning the law, the Old Testament law, then bring death to me? Again, a a strong uh, negative. By no means it was sin producing death in me through what is good, through the law, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Verse number 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but... Now, by contrast, I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, God's law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that... Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse number 21. So I find there to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now there are a few little comments that I need to make to essentially clarify a couple of things. Um, And then we'll get started on the basic outline. And the outline today is six or seven kind of big idea words. I think if you look at the outline in the bulletin, you'll see that it's mostly blanks to fill in for the primary points. And so these just one word points for many of them. But let me clarify a couple of things. First of all, this passage is repetitive. What Paul the Apostle is saying here is relatively simple. He just says it multiple different ways. And sometimes he practically says the same thing the same way (laughs) again a second or even a third time. So this passage is repetitive. We shouldn't be intimidated by that. It's it's relatively simple, and he just says those same things again and sometimes again and again. And then a second thing that needs to be clarified is that the term law can have more than one meaning in this passage. So the common meaning of the law in the book of Romans so far has been God's law, represented by, let's just say, the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, all of the ways in which 
The law, as we said last week, represents God's holy and good character, represents God's will for his people, represents um, the way a society should function, and of course then also prepares the way for Christ. Those sacrifices and ceremonies and the priesthood and all of that. So it can be used to represent the Old Testament law of God. But also in verse 23... He uses, I'm sorry, verses 21 and 23, he uses the, the word law to mean something like a principle or maybe an authoritative principle. So look at verse number 23. I see in my members another law waging, so it's something different than the law of God, right? Another law waging war against the law of my mind, Right, so he's saying that there's, there's something else going on. There is a, another principle at work. right? And then the law of his mind, sort of his own desires, the own principles by which he would personally like to live. And they make him captive to the law or the principle or the authority of sin in his members. And so the illustration of this that's classic, many other people have used this, is we refer, do we not, to the law of gravity, right? The, the law of gravity. The law of gravity, I suppose, is written down, but it's just there whether you write it down or not. In fact, it's there whether you believe in it or not, right? The, the law of gravity is the principle that um, body mass attracts, right? And so they pull in, the larger one pulls in the smaller one, and that's the reason shoes fall on the floor and why we fall on the floor sometimes, right? It's the principle that we use to describe this reality that happens. And so he is using that in that term. In fact, we could even call this sermon the gravitational pull of sin, right? Because that's essentially what he's talking about, this, this gravitational pull of sin and temptation and indwelling sin nature. Something else that um, needs to be clarified is we need to remember he refers a couple of times to his flesh and to his members. And we need to just remember that unlike the way we might tend to interpret that as just body, bone, and blood, that Paul the Apostle is thinking of his entire personhood when he refers to his members because, of course, he would include his mind, right, and his heart. And especially when it comes to, when he uses the word flesh, he's thinking of that, the entire person, really apart from God. Apart from God's work in his life, in his heart. And then one final clarification is this. This passage is complex. Some commentators have called this the most well-known passage in the book of Romans because it has been inter it's been the subject of a lot of controversy. But nevertheless, this passage and how it relates to Romans chapter 6 and how it relates to Romans chapter 8 is complex. And all I really want to say about that, I do not want to sort of go through all the debates. I will mention one of them later in the sermon. But all I want to say is simply this. The Christian life is complex. Okay, and so there are, it's not all victory and it's not all defeat. And so we have those realities represented in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And today, it is much of the, de the defeat side of that. It is a lot of how do we wrestle with when we are uh, defeated by sin and temptation. So, as I've said, these six or seven words, you copy these down as we go down through the outline. Number one, confusion. Confusion. We see this especially starting in verse number 15. But I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if you're a Christian here this morning, there are some things that you know. There are some things that the book of Romans has already taught us. Number one, sin is bad. <laughs> Okay, this is not rocket science here this morning, okay? Right? The, Romans has taught us, the Bible has taught us, Christian theology and tradition has taught us, right, that sin is bad. Sin has been described in the book of Romans as enslavement to self-destruction. It is enslavement 
to self-destruction, right? And another thing that we know is, is that God's will revealed in God's law is good. He has repeated this already in verse number 14, but he said it two or three times already in chapter 7 and some previous places as well. For we know that the law is spiritual. We know that it is good. And so God's will for people to live represented in God's law is good. And we also know that believers have not only been granted forgiveness for our sins, but we have also been given freedom from the power of sin. We saw that repeatedly in Romans chapter 6. But somehow we still give in to sin and temptation, and that is confusing. Right? That, okay, that, that's confusing. If it was confusing for Paul, then it should be confusing to us. And I think the application there is, is if we shrug our shoulders about sin, we might not be a Christian. Okay? That Paul the Apostle, what's going on here is not Paul going, eh. No, he is, he is heartbroken over this confusion in his life. And, of course, we see that later as the text goes down. It just is more and more and more intense. Now, as Paul describes this, what seems so confusing is that we, he, and we seem to be, as it were, divided. So, number two, division. Division. In verses 17 to 20, Paul is expressing from his own perspective that he is experiencing something like kind of the divided self. The simplest way to put it is that part of him wants to do what is right, but he is sometimes powerless to accomplish it. Part of him wants to do what is right, but he can't always do it. And then to make matters work, he frequently ends up doing the opposite. He ends up doing sinful things that he did not, in his heart of hearts, did not really want to do. So, verse 17. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Verse number 20. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So this sense of division in Paul the Apostle and you may have experienced this as well. In fact, if you, you either have a choice. You can shrug off sin or you can wrestle with these things. Why do I not always do the right thing that I know that I really kind of want to do, but at the same time, why do I sometimes do evil that I, I, sh I know I should not do, and not only that, I don't want to. And so he's wrestling with these things, and he's saying that the sense of division in his own heart and in his own experience, is so real and so deep that he actually says, it's not even me that's really doing it. By the way, by the way, let me just put a little parenthesis around that and say, Paul the Apostle is not, he is not denying his own responsibility for his sins. He certainly is not doing that. I believe what he is doing is he is saying that there is a sin nature, a sin indwelling him, a sin nature indwelling him in him that remains even after his conversion, that it has, as it were, taken on a life of its own, this sin nature. I think you have experienced that. If you are a Christian, this remaining indwelling sin can feel as if it has taken on a life of its own. Another, in, in another way of saying what he is saying here when he says it is no longer I who do it, it is this, that if there was not a remaining, indwelling sin nature, he would not sin. It's another way of saying what he is getting at there. Now, I think we do need to remind ourselves of something that I said last week, and I basically just was quoting last week, J.I. Packer, who explained the sin nature in this way. He said that the sin nature within us, or he kind of called it original sin, but nevertheless, the sin nature within us is a perverted energy, a perverted energy that distracts us from God and pushes us towards selfishness and sin. 
So this remaining sin within us, it, is, it does have sort of its own energy, <laughs> right? And it pushes us. It's a perverted energy that pushes us through desires, through distraction, through uh, direct attack against us, through temptation, to choose what is wrong and evil instead of choosing what is right and choosing God. Now, number three, part of this sense of dividedness is that the Christian experiences both this perverted energy of the sin nature, but also experiences agreeing with God and agreeing with God's will and agreeing with God's law. And they delight even in that. So number three, delight. Delight. Look at verse number 22. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. So for all of Paul's honesty about this struggle and this battle and this often being defeated by sin, he also can honestly say that at the same time, he also delights in, he loves God's law. He is really parroting some of the things in the Psalms that we might read. And until the overthrow of Roe v. Wade came along, I was going to have in our bulletin and read from Psalm 19, where it talks about God's law as sweeter than honey and even the honeycomb, that it is perfect, that it is light, and it is instructive for us. And the psalmist there loves and delights in the law of God. And so Paul is parroting that back, and he says genuinely and honestly in his heart, he not only experiences defeat at the hands of his own sin nature, he also loves God's law. Now, if we've been kind of listening to Paul the Apostle and the anguish of his soul and the honesty of his heart so far in Romans chapter 7, we might start to ask ourselves, you know, is he speaking from the perspective of a Christian about his own conversion or his own experience as a Christian how can that possibly be? How can a Christian both be set free from sin and at the same time be defeated by it? So consequently, some people think that Paul is looking backwards, that he is using present tense nouns, but he is uh, verbs, but he is actually uh, looking backwards on his previous experience of a Jewish person that is kind of bearing the weight or the frown of God's condemning law. But I believe that there are clear indications that he is speaking as a Christian. Number one, he does use present tense verbs. And he's saying all of these things as if they are happening to him in the here and the now as an apostle. Not only a Christian, but as an apostle. And also here in this verse, unbelievers do not delight in God bossing them around. Okay? They do not delight in God's commandments. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a person, the law is either pure imposition or condemnation. Like, don't tell me what to do or just guilt. That's all it is apart from the Holy Spirit and apart from Christian experience. So I believe that Paul is speaking as a Christian because he delights in the law of God. And that's the reason that this is a struggle. Right, is because he has evil desires and godly delights at the same time. In fact, that's another application of this passage, and that is to ask ourselves if God's word and God's will and God's commands are sweet to us. Do we delight in them? Do we enjoy understanding, reading, and interacting with God's word? Do we understand and, and do we even appreciate the ways in which it opens up our heart and shows us the real us? Do we appreciate that God uses His Word in these ways to sometimes plow deep so that He can plant the seeds of holiness into our hearts? Even when it's convicting like Paul is experiencing here. Do you have a delight in the Word of God? Because God's people delight in his law. In fact, we're happy. We're happy to have God boss us around, right? We're happy to receive his commands and the call of his will upon our lives because we know that 
that is how we um, glorify God and enjoy him forever. So this confusion and this division and at the same time this delight in God's law is summarized in verse 23. Verse number 23. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So number four, conflict. Conflict. This is combat vocabulary, isn't it? We have the law that is waging war against the law of his mind. And that is really the law of sin that is taking him captive. So waging war and taking captives, that is this combat vocabulary. Part of our Christian experience is Christian or spiritual warfare. That's the reason that we've sung about these themes here this morning. And at least part of that warfare happens inside of us. It happens inside of us. In fact, if you are not fighting for holiness in your heart, you have no business engaging the culture wars. Okay, right? Th because that, the world sees that hypocrisy immediately. If you're not fighting personal sin, then you have no business sort of fighting for truth on the cultural scene. It's a battle between our new nature and our sin nature. So why don't we turn over to Galatians Galatians chapter 5. And, of course, the book of Romans and the book of Galatians are both written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so here, he's really just pounding away at the drum of this same idea again, just in another context and another passage. So, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 16, and I'll read 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And there, here he says it. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the Holy Spirit are against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. And so he says here that we often feel the reality of being caught in between the work of the Holy Spirit and our sin nature remaining within us. So the application here for this point would simply be that we need to accept the reality of this warfare and battle and we need to engage the battle. Both Galatians chapter 5 gives that command as well because it says walk by the Spirit. And then when we get into Romans chapter 8, we will see that that is essentially what it talks about, how the power of the Spirit gives a person vitality and victory in this battle. And so, both Romans 8, Galatians 5 would want us to walk by the Spirit and battle the impulses of our sinful nature. Accept the reality of the battle and engage that battle, depending upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two other sort of responses, two other applications that come in sort of points number 5 and 6. So, number 5 cry of despair cry of despair i've already sort of alluded uh, to this fact that you know various bible students try to interpret this in different ways some of them saying that this has to be this has to be the uh, experience of a of a person who is not a Christian yet. Maybe they're almost a Christian. Maybe they're the under the conviction or under the condemnation of the law. But some, one time a, a young college student must have been at a Christian college because J.I. Packer came to speak at the college and he, he allowed students to make an appointment with him. And as far as this student knew, um, he was the only one who made an appointment. What a... Sorry, college students, for not making an appointment with one of my Christian heroes, right? But anyway, uh, he sat down with J.I. Packer, and he said, I cannot understand Romans chapter 7. How can Paul, not only a Christian, but an apostle, struggle so incredibly deeply with sin at such a basic level? How can he be defeated so deeply? 
and J.I. Packer leaned so, kind of into the table, and he's very soft. He was, before he passed away, a very soft-spoken person. He leaned into the table, and he, he looked at this young man, and he said, Paul is not struggling because he is such a terrible sinner. He's struggling because he is a saint. And every time he sins, it bothers him terribly. Even when the sin is quote unquote small, he experiences, he is serious about holiness. And he experiences the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And it hurts. And he has anguish over his sins. Unbelievers don't care. Believers do. They care. And Paul, of course, as a preeminent godly believer, cared deeply. This same student grew up to become himself a theology professor and used a couple of illustrations to help illustrate this. He told about one time, uh, one of the, they had a vanity mirror in their bathroom, right, that's kind of surrounded, like sort of Hollywood style, right, surrounded by bulbs, really bright bulbs for putting on makeup and combing your hair and brushing your teeth, right? And, and one of them burned out, and they were, they were vanity light bulbs, right? They were specialty bulbs. And they didn't have any of those. They said, ah, just take them all out. And they put in a whole array of 60-watt bulbs. And all of a sudden, the sink was filthy, right? Because before, these were probably like 20-watt bulbs or 15-watt bulbs or something like that. And they really multiplied the wattage of light that's in the room. And, and because of that, all, all of a sudden, the sink is just really grimy. And that's true for us. The Holy Spirit is the 60 or 100 or 1,000 watt light bulb shining on the griminess of our hearts. Before that, before you're a Christian, all you have is the weak wattage of your conscience. When the Holy Spirit indwells you, although your sin nature does not go away, it sure looks dirty. And it concerns you and confuses you and causes conflict in your heart, personal inner conflict. And it seems like you're divided in your desires. He also used another illustration, <laughs> very simple. It's a lot easier to see a black spider when you're wearing a white shirt, right? Uh, if it's on you, of course, right? Or it's easier to see a black spider on a white wall or whatever you want to say. And so, yes, Paul is deeply concerned, and that is why he cries out in despair in verse number 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And, and by the way, by the way, part of the answer is contained even in the verse or the question itself. He says, who will deliver me? Future tense. So from verse 14 down to verse 23, everything he said is in present tense. Every verb is in present tense. It's something that is experiencing and happening now. But now he looks towards the future and he says, who is going to deliver me in the future in the future, from this body of death, from this experience of this division and this confusion and this conflict, it's going to kill me. Who will deliver me? <laughs> and so that reminds us that it's a who. It's a person who delivers. And the full, the full deliverance is yet future. There can be a level, and there should be a level, of deliverance from our sins. Even now, there should be some victory, but the full deliverance from sin for all Christians and that we long for will not be complete until our resurrection. This is how Christopher Ashe put this. When the Spirit writes the law of God on our hearts, a desperate struggle begins in a believer that will not end until the resurrection. And so uh, he, uh, Christopher Ashe used this illustration. He said, Indwelling sin or our sin nature is like those trick birthday candles that won't blow out, right? And they keep coming. And there may be a bonfire of spiritual good and pursuit of holiness, and that's what you should have and should want. But occasionally a little spark will reignite the sin nature within. Victory is possible, but it's not complete. Full victory is awaits the coming of our Lord. And folks, that should make us two things. Anticipate, look forward to the coming of our Lord and full deliverance from even the presence of temptation even within us. And it should also make us more and more and more dependent upon the Holy Spirit 
because sin is close at hand. Isn't that what he said? It, it dwells within him. Evil, verse number 21, second half, evil lies close at hand. And so we should be increasingly more and more dependent upon Jesus. Number six, hope in the midst of struggle. Hope in the midst of struggle. Verse number 25, he says two very true things, but very different things. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the deliverer. He is the deliverer. He is the one who delivers us from the penalty of sin and grants us forgiveness and justification, and he will deliver us from the presence of sin when he returns. So Jesus is the who in the question in, chapter, in verse 24. Thanks, to be God, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But he doesn't just say that. He also says, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Essentially what he is saying is the struggle continues until the day when Jesus Christ comes and delivers us from the very presence of sin. There will be the ups and downs of the battle again and again and again and again. Now, there are a number of ways that I should close with application this morning, so please uh, keep, uh, keep going with me and listen carefully. Um, if you are tempted to look for a spiritual silver bullet that will somehow take away the struggle and guarantee victory against sin every single time, then Romans chapter 7 says that's a fool's errand. There is no such thing as silver bullet Christianity. There is both the glorious redemption given to us in Christ Jesus, forgiveness and growing victory, and there is ongoing struggle until we meet the Lord. There is no such thing as silver bullet Christianity. The reality of Christian living is battle with sin, including external temptation and internal sinful desires, right? And to some degree, we need to get used to that, right? To, to be disappointed in yourself is to have trusted in yourself. You need to trust in somebody else right? because you will disappoint yourself. Um, it, beyond that, this has been the genuine experience of the saints throughout all of the ages. Paul the apostle, preeminent apostle that he was, Towards the end of his life, what did he refer to himself as? The chief of sinners, the greatest of sinners. We can think back about Abraham. He had a bedrock faith in, in God. Believed the promises against all hope, believed the promises. And at the same time, he had the obvious failure of not trusting in the timing of those promises and fathering Ishmael to the great grief of the nation of Israel. Uh, Abraham's offspring. David, a man after God's own heart, referred to as the sweet psalmist of Israel, could write praise and worship, could bear his soul before God in the most beautiful poetry, and at the same time is the same man that committed adultery with Bathsheba and engaged in a cover-up, a political-style cover-up that ended in murder. That man, this has been the experience of the saints down through the ages. And of course, those biblical examples are rather extreme, right? Because we also have the prophet Elijah just kind of whining, right? And being discouraged to the point that he thinks he's the only one left, right? Very self-centered. That's probably along the lines of our experience, right? Just being kind of self-focused and getting things out of focus because of our sin nature and self-focus. The key fact in these examples that I've already used is that these people repented. They, they, they repented. They sorrowed over their sins and returned to faithfulness to God. Peter wrestled with this, right? He not only abandoned like the rest of the disciples, he also directly denied even knowing Jesus. And again, the key fact there is he repented. And we, of course, are much like the disciples, are we not? Sometimes victorious, Right? Sometimes preaching the gospel of the kingdom and sometimes 
a little mouse that's afraid to say anything about Jesus. Another godly individual from the past, Jonathan Edwards, wrote this. When I look into my heart and take a view of my wickedness, it looks like an abyss, infinitely deeper than hell. And it appears to me that were it not for free grace, I should appear sunk down in my sins, infinitely below, below hell itself. And yet it seems to me my conviction of sin is exceedingly small and faint. When I have had turns of weeping and crying for my sins, I thought that I knew in the time of it that my repentance was nothing compared to my sin. Genuine disciples stumble and fail. It doesn't mean that they're not Christians. It doesn't mean that they're somehow second-class citizens. It means that they're real Christians when their heart is broken over the stumble and the failure. All followers of Jesus experience something of the anguish of Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Who will deliver me? Who will deliver me? And of course, that verse answers itself. And the next verse, that the who, there is a person who has intervened and will intervene again when he comes and deliver us fully. He's coming back to finish the work that he has started in us. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, our hearts um, feel along with Paul this anguish, this confusion and division and dividedness in our hearts. At the same time that we see the goodness of your word and your will, at the same time that we experience a measure at different times, more than others, but we experience a measure of victory and godliness in our lives and we cry out who will deliver us who will deliver us and we look forward to the day when christ does and we ask that you would allow us O oh god to um, press on in the meantime in daily struggle against internal sin we ask these things in the name of jesus amen kind of maybe to solidify these things in our hearts as well as to help us in learning this new song, we're going to sing again, My Worth is Not in What I Own. And especially kind of the idea in that song where we confess both our worth and our worthiness is very much in line with Romans 7 there. Would you please stand as we sing together? is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or in a win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flows at the cross. I rejoice. I rejoice in my Redeemer, the greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. Trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. As summer flowers, we fade and die. Fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal. in wealth or mind or human 
something on your heart that you would like to talk or pray with me about, I certainly want to be available for that. I believe that this passage, not only itself being somewhat complex, um, it describes the complexity of our hearts. And I hope that whether you talk to me about it or not, that some of that has been stirred up and that you will think and pray about your own battle in this conflict against sin. Go in the grace of the Lord. You're dismissed. <laughs>